everybody, Dr. Nicole here. It's uh, the end of the day at my clinic, um, and I know it's a terrible time to be probably um, on Facebook Live. I know many of you are um, just getting home from work or maybe on your way home from work. Um, as parents, it's a super busy time because um, you know kids are home from school and you're doing dinner and all of that. Um, I just wanted to um, come on here to talk about um, difficult events that have been happening in our country um, yesterday and um, and over the course of this entire year so far and and for years now with all the school violence that's happening and um, when these things happen it really shakes us as parents in a lot of ways um, and I've had a lot of people ask me to speak to this issue because I am a mom. Um, those of you who know me, I'm a mom of four kids and um, also with the work that I do with children and young adults in mental health. And when tragedies happen, like what happened in Florida yesterday, um, you know, I spend a good portion then of the next day and, and the following um, you know, week talking with kids and, and talking with families who are really scared and, and traumatized by um, events like that, even when it doesn't happen in our own neighborhood or in a kid's own school. Um, the idea of uh, going to school and having something horrific like that happen is really scary for kids and it's scary for us as parents. Um, so yesterday, um, you know, 17 people were killed in the shooting um, in Florida and uh, I, I took a quick look at statistics um, today, and I think that the estimate is that so far in 2018, we've had two point, every, every two and a half days, um, there's been some kind of violent um, shooting episode like this in the U.S. And uh, we seem to be, as a country, a lot more invested in um, arguing about the issue or being right about the issue. Um, then we are invested in actually doing anything about it, which um, is terrifying in and of itself. Um, certainly there's a ton of talk and, and conversation on both sides about guns and gun control and all of that. And I think most of us with good common sense and um, rational thinking skills can agree that access to guns is certainly part of the problem. Um, I hear mental health being thrown around a lot, especially right now that, well, it's, this is a mental health problem and if we just dealt with mental health better, and certainly that's a part of the issue. There's a lot of reasons why we need to be invested in improving mental health and healthcare in general. Um, in this country. Um, so it, it, a lot of us feel sort of paralyzed, like when are, when are we going to actually decide to do something um, about this? And as parents, it's really scary because our kids are seeing this stuff and, and feel frightened and certainly they're not immune to hearing about this and seeing all the information on, on social media and um, and it's scary for kids of any age. And as parents, we wonder what to do. How do we talk to our kids about that? What do we tell them to do? Um, it's really hard for us, even as adults, to comprehend that these kinds of things happen um, and, and to process that with our level of maturity and thinking, let alone to be able to talk with kids about it. Um, but I spent quite a lot of time today and, and over time um, talking with kids about this. So I can certainly share some insights on that just from my perspective as a parent myself, as well as a mental health professional. Um, I, I think what it comes down to is we live in a world where a lot of people are hurting a lot of the time. Um, these kinds of things happen because people are hurting. Now we can call it um, you know, severe mental health problems, we can call it whatever we want to call it, but especially when we look at situations like what happened yesterday um, and what has happened in many of these kinds of violent school episodes where it's children themselves committing these atrocities, it's teenagers, it's young adults. Um, sure, we can call it mental health, we can say whatever we want to say about that, but I work with a lot of kids who have these types of challenges and issues, and what I know is that no kid 
sets out to be a kid who's going to do these kinds of things. And no parent, you know, there's a lot of blame that goes around for, for parents and, um, and even for teachers and other people in these kids' lives. Certainly no one um, intends for this stuff to happen. And um, it's very easy for um, people in politics or whatever to uh, go on TV and say, you know, this is a failure to report problems and people know that these kids are having problems and they're not saying anything. And, you know, especially when I heard that earlier today, um, that the problem is that so many people knew that this young man was having issues, um, you know, with his behavior and with his mental health and whatever, and no one reported it. And I, I sat back and I went, report it to who? <laughs> Um, who, who, who are we supposed to report that to? There are kids and young adults and people in every community across America who are having challenges and issues, sometimes severe ones. And we have a breakdown in our system in terms of how to go about managing that. Um, who, who are we supposed to report that to? Um, are we supposed to call the police every time a school has, you know, a child who seems to be emotionally disturbed or, you know, is having some issues? Do we call the police even though there hasn't been a crime that's committed? Hmm, is that what we're supposed to do? Um, oh, maybe we're supposed to call a mental health agency. Well, okay, what are they supposed to do with that? Because I've been working in mental health for a long time and our community mental health agencies are not staffed or equipped to be properly managing or, or, or to handle these kinds of things. So are we supposed to call them? Um, who, who are we supposed to call about this kind of stuff? Who are we supposed to report it to? Um, I think that in many of these situations where kids have committed these atrocities, yeah, people have been aware that there's issues and there's challenges, and what do we do with that is the question, and that's where the breakdown comes. And um, I had a, a really close friend of mine who said something to me earlier today that stuck with me. Um, he said, you know, this is what happens in society when we put things like education and health care at the bottom of our priority list, and, and I think there's really truth to that. Um, we talk a lot about education and we talk a lot about health care and, and mental health in this country, but we don't really do anything about it. We certainly don't put the dollars behind it to support those kinds of um, measures that would help people in our country to actually be physically and mentally more healthy, to help families have the supports that they need to raise kids in healthy ways, to give our schools the tools and the people resources that they need to be able to meet the needs of kids with all kinds of challenges and issues. Um, we don't put the money where it needs to be to support that stuff. And, you know, I have the unique situation as well where I have worked in the schools. I've been a teacher. I've been a consultant in schools. There are many wonderful people in schools all across this country who desperately want to meet the needs of all of the kids who are coming through their doors and even kids with really significant challenges. And they are spread so thin and the resources are so thin and the caseloads are so high. Um, school psychologists, school counselors, um, social workers, uh, special education people, people who can you know, play a role in helping to support these kids and their needs, they have ridiculously high caseloads. They're not given the time or the resources to do that, and so kids fall through the cracks. Um, and, and that's really what I see is happening across the board in this country, um, is kids with these kinds of needs are, are falling through the cracks. And if their families don't have the financial resources or the um, knowledge of where and how to seek out some support and some help, then they're not, they're not getting um, the help that they need. Um, and then we put kids who haven't gotten the help that they have needed and we've failed them and we've let them fall through the cracks. Um, then we put them, you know, out there in a world where we make things like, um, you know, guns and other types of weapons readily available to them. And we sit back and we wonder why um, we get these kinds of situations. And it's just, um, it's somewhat baffling to me because it seems pretty obvious and, and um, you know, that, that this is going to happen unless we start to make some changes to how we handle things. Um, it's not just about guns. It's not just about mental health. It's about a much bigger 
um, issue, uh, I think, in this country about prioritizing children, prioritizing families, um, structuring things in a way so that parents have the support and the resources that they need to be able to do the job that they want to do with their kids to be able to have um, you know the time and and the financial resources to be able to support them well um, it's about putting more money and more support into our educational system to be able to give teachers and counselors and people in our school systems not just more security guards and not an armed police officer um, but to give them really the resources that they need to be able to invest in the tools and the people that they need to make a difference in the lives of, of troubled kids. Um, it's about um, looking at common sense changes that we need to make um, related to how accessible uh, guns um, and, and weapons are in this country. It's about a whole lot of things. And there's plenty of blame to go around. And when things like this happen, I think it's normal. We feel anxious. We feel at a loss for what to do. And so everybody seeks to look at who to blame and what to blame, and we just end up pointing fingers and arguing about it. Um, but for those of you who are in situations where you have kids coming home to you now tonight who, who feel scared, as parents you feel scared. I had so many parents say to me today, you know, I, when things like this happen, I just feel like I don't even want to send my child to school the next day. You know, it's terrifying. And, and what do I say to them? And what do we do? So um, I, have, I have some suggestions for whatever they're, whatever they're worth. I, I think the first thing that's most important is to take time to be with your child. Um, incidents like this make us really aware of how not in control we are of things in the world and how none of us is guaranteed the next moment or the next day. Um, and I think that it can help us to um, reevaluate our priorities and our perspective on things. Uh, and I would say, especially right now, um, when things like this are fresh in our mind and they're on the minds of our kids, take time to be with your kids. Um, put down your devices more than you maybe would or set aside the work tonight that you know you maybe would um, take home with you. Take time to really connect with your kids and be with them, whether that's over the dinner table or hanging out and watching part of the Olympics on TV or sitting and reading a book or just sitting and, and chatting with them and being with them and, and give them um, some extra attention and some extra love and some extra time. Uh, be willing to hear them, be willing to listen to them, encourage them to talk about how they're feeling. When tragic situations like this happen, there can be a tendency on our part as adults, as well as for kids, to just avoid it. Um, let's not talk about it, let's pretend it's not upsetting, let's pretend it didn't happen. And, and that's damaging for all of us. It's especially damaging for kids. Kids need to have an opportunity to talk about how they're feeling and the things that they're thinking about and the questions that they have so they can process through it. And as adults, we need to be comfortable with giving them the time and the space to be able to talk about that, even though it does make us uncomfortable because we feel like we don't know what to say and we don't have all the answers. So give them time and an opportunity to talk about things. Raise it with them. Ask them how they're feeling about it. Share with them um, how you're feeling about it that you feel scared, that, that you don't have all the answers, that you know it's hard to know what to do. Um, be empathic to them with, with how they're feeling, however they're feeling about it, whether they're scared or angry or hurt or whatever it might be, just allow them to express that and acknowledge that and encourage them to share that because um, you know that that's probably one of the most beneficial things we can do for kids during a time like this. I think practically speaking, it's also beneficial to um, remind kids or talk with them about the plans that are in place or that you're aware of for how their school manages 
crisis situations, assuring them that there is a plan in place. If you're not sure that there is, then talk with the people at your child's school about what the crisis plan is for things like that and reassure your child that um, you know, we cannot guarantee our kids that these things won't happen at their school and you shouldn't try and you shouldn't do that and you shouldn't feel like you need to offer false assurances because the reality is that we can't and we can be honest with them about that. But we can also be clear that their schools have thought through these things and have plans in place for that. And I love what um, Mr. Rogers always uh, said about crisis times like this. And he, he would tell kids to look for the helpers. Um, and I love that. And I think that that's a valuable thing to talk with um, our children about is that when you are feeling scared, if something you know terrible does happen, always look for the helpers. There's always people there that are helping, whether it's you know, teachers or whether it's, um, you know, firefighters or police officers or other parents or whoever it might be that when they're in a time of crisis or distress or feeling really fearful to look for the people who are helping. Um, and, and that's an important thing to reiterate um, with them. Um, I think, you know, another practical thing to consider, especially if you have a child who's feeling really anxious about things right now. Um, I think everybody feels more nervous um, during times like this, but some children, especially if they already are prone to anxiety or have a, a pretty significant anxiety disorder, this kind of stuff can really um, ratchet up for them and they can really struggle. And if you have kids who are really struggling right now or their anxiety is a lot higher or they're, they're you know, just really having a tough time, I would encourage you to really stick to routines right now in your life and at home. Now is not the time to be taking on a whole lot of um, things or, or having new things happening during these times. It's good for kids to be able to have their predictable, comfortable, safe routines, uh, whether that's at home or daycare or school or whatever it might be. Um, you know, with the weekend coming up, I would encourage you again, if you have a child who's really struggling with this or if you're really struggling with this yourself, um, just lay low for the weekend. <laughs> Um, don't maybe go and, and make a bunch of plans or don't feel like you have to stick to the hundred different things you were going to do. Um, it's a good time to just sort of simplify things and again have some of that predictable structure and spend more um, quality time with your kids. Um, you know, again, in the coming days to be able to do that, I think you'll find that helpful. Um, one of the things that I've talked with my kids about um, and, and that I keep coming back to uh, because it's a pattern so much in these kinds of um, violent episodes that happen um, it is related to inclusiveness. It's related to being aware of how um, their peers and, and other kids might be feeling and experiencing and to be empathic and, and to reach out to kids. Um, because if we look at the patterns that have gone on um, in virtually every single major um, school shooting situation that has happened, um, where it's been a teenager or a young adult who has committed, you know, one of these, um, you know, atrocities, uh, it, it comes back to when we start to see more of, um, you know, on the news, the unfolding of what that person's experience was, both in school and life in general, there is always a pattern of isolation, of social isolation, of not having connections to other people, of not being included um, in things, of being ostracized. Um, and usually that's because of various types of challenges that, that these kids had all along the way, and it can be difficult for them to fit <laughs> Um, into the social structure um, of school and of communities. And, uh, you know, these tend to be the kids who are loners, who don't have anyone to sit with um, at lunch, who kind of keep to themselves, who may uh, have very prolific, you know, social media um, postings uh, about things, but really uh, don't talk about or, or share things with other people because they don't have friends. Um, they maybe are not really connected with any of um, you know the people in their community or even teachers at school. And we know that human connection is one of the most foundational and fundamental needs that we have as human beings. All of us are 
built for and made for being in relationship with other people. And so when, when kids are in situations where they're experiencing chronic isolation, and sometimes that starts even in their home life of being really neglected or isolated or you know detached for whatever reason, and then that can happen in school as well. Kids who just don't fit the mold, kids who don't fit in well with other kids, kids who struggle with things, and then they're the ones that tend to be left out and isolated and bullied and, and all of those things. And then those kids grow into teenagers and young adults who really are having even more struggles because of that disconnection and that isolation. And, and I have found through all my years of working in the schools, of working in agency and hospital settings and working in private practice, that all it takes is one meaningful connection for kids to start to feel better about themselves and to feel like um, they have something, an important relationship in their life. And so it doesn't matter whether it is a teacher who takes a kid under their wing or it's another student at the school who takes some time to sit down with them um, you know, in the cafeteria, or it's a janitor who takes a moment to look that kid in the eye and wish them, you know, good luck with their day each morning, or it can be somebody through um, a church or, you know, a community organization. Um, all it takes is one meaningful connection to make such a profound difference in the lives of kids who struggle with these things, um, whether they're struggling with behavioral disorders, struggling with depression, anxiety, um, you know, severe mental health issues, whatever it might be, human connection is, is the antidote for that. And so from a very practical standpoint, one of the things that I talk to my kids about and, and with kids at the clinic about is, being intentional about connecting with people who maybe don't have those connections and watching for the kid who is alone in the cafeteria every day or taking a moment to connect even just with a good morning to somebody who tends to stick by themselves or seem kind of just angry and hostile at the world. Um, to, to take the time to connect with those kids to take the time to reach out to them. Doesn't have to be a big interaction, but I think that that is partly the antidote for what's going on with kids who feel so profoundly disconnected from everyone and everything in their life that they go into this world and this state where it's more likely that they, you know, commit horrible crimes like this. Um, so talk to your kids about noticing those kinds of kids in their school environment, in their church group, in their you know Boy Scout or Girl Scout group, and be intentional about connecting with them and reaching out to them and be that person who maybe forms a bridge and, and helps that isolated depressed, you know, whatever we want to say about those kids helps them to feel like they have some worth and some value and that someone is noticing them. Um, uh, we have a, a profound need to feel like people see us and, and notice us. And so something as simple as sitting next to that kid in the cafeteria or helping that child in the classroom that seems to get distressed pretty quickly um, can be a very tangible thing that our children can do to help people feel seen and feel appreciated and acknowledged. And I think that goes a long way to meeting the needs of kids who otherwise may grow up to have a lot of these very profound um, you know, issues in their life. And the same goes for us as uh, parents and adults working with kids as well. Um, when I was teaching in the schools, I tended to always uh, work with the kids who very few people wanted to work with. Uh, I've always had a heart for kids with, you know, pretty severe issues. And what I found was most important was exactly that, helping them 
to feel seen and helping them to feel acknowledged and appreciated and loved regardless of what their behavior was like, regardless of what was going on um, in their lives, regardless of what their grades were, regardless of how miserable they were, you know, making people around them, just making sure that they knew that I saw them, that I appreciated them, and that I was there for them. So those can be the hardest kids to, to love and to reach out to and want to um, connect with, whether you're a teacher or a secretary in a school or you are a counselor you know, in an outpatient mental health clinic or you are you know, the parent leading the, um, you know, the, the Boy Scout group or whatever it is. But for us to remember as adults that when we can play a role of acknowledging and helping a child feel seen, and feel appreciated and feel loved, that's a very tangible, very simple, but profoundly important role that we can play for those kids. And I guarantee for every single one of us, there is a kid that we can have in our minds right now that we know about somewhere in our community, somewhere in our circles of people that we interact with on a regular basis. There's a kid that each of us knows that desperately needs that. And so my challenge to each of us as adults is to be intentional over the course of the coming days and weeks to be um, a touch point for that kid that we each know is out there, to, to reach out, to help that person, that child feel seen and heard and acknowledged. Um, it's, it's a simple thing that we can do, but I think that we brush it off and we don't do enough of it. But I can say that having worked with these kinds of kids for 20 years now, something as simple as that can make such a profound difference. So I challenge um, you to do that, especially during this time when we feel like maybe there's not a lot we can do. We feel like things are just kind of out of control and, you know, Congress isn't doing anything and, our, you know, no, nothing seems to be changing. We need to look at what we can control and can tangibly do. And so I think reaching out and being that touchstone for people, um, however brief or however simple that interaction might be, but to take some action to help the people that we're aware of in our kids' school, in our community, in our, um, you know, wherever we are, and helping them to feel seen and acknowledged and heard, that helps us feel like we're doing something and that actually makes a profound change and to encourage our kids to do the same. Um, so th those were... Those were the things that I was thinking about, and, and those are some of the things I've been talking about with people here um, at the clinic today. Um, I, this, um, I know I've been on here talking for a while. I didn't really have a plan uh, when I sat down to do this. I just felt compelled to come on and, and share some of this from my heart because I know so many of us are dealing with it. So hopefully there's something in there um, that you may find helpful uh, to yourself or for your kids. And just know that we're all in this together, right? Um, I've been a professional doing this work for a long time and I certainly don't have um, all the answers. Um, so it's okay to not have the answers and, and we're all kind of in this together. And um, despite the differences of opinions we might have on the bigger issues of what needs to happen here. Let's all try to um, come together to support our kids and to support each other as parents, as professionals who are trying to make a difference with this stuff. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, head home and have dinner with my kids and my family and spend some extra time, um, you know, with them tonight. And, and I encourage you to do the same. Um, and just give yourself some time to feel however you're feeling um, and just know that um, these are not easy things and, and, and that it's okay and, and let's all support each other with that. So um, hopefully you found something in this helpful um, and I hope that you are able to spend a little bit of extra time with your kids tonight. Um, give them um, an extra hug and let's all do what we can um, to support the kids in our own lives and in our communities. Um, I will plan to come back on and talk to you again soon. Thanks. Have a great night.